I, wa I want to be clear that I'm not doing data analysis here. There seems to be a quite a focus on uh, analyzing data from different perspectives. And in my work, I don't really have data. I'm much more interested in conceptual understanding. I'm interested in how to teach these topics. I'm interested in how art can help developing the ideas. And I'm interested in how the ideas of special and general relativity can help art. I'm quite interested in this flow of ideas backwards and forwards. But my world, certainly for this particular research bank, I don't have any data as such in it, so I feel a, a bit of an outsider here. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about relativity. I don't want this to be a physics course at all, but I just want to illustrate the, the aspects of relativity that I'm interested in. I've been recently asked to teach special and general relativity as part of our astrophysics major, and I've been pondering how to, how to present these subjects and how to make it accessible and how to, to leverage the open source uh, spirit of art. So, special relativity is quite interesting. It, it, it's suitable for mathematics or physics, physics undergraduates. It's quite a sexy topic. It's, uh, people are quite interested in this. People are quite interested in the fact that the speed of light is the sort of speed limit of the universe. Uh, what happens when you try to go faster than light? Um, Einstein, of course, is a, is a tremendously powerful icon and a very, uh, a very attractive figure for, for lots of people to study. So I find myself uh, teaching a topic that's got very high expectations. One of the problems that you face when you teach the topic is that in order to get any kind of an insight at all into how relativity works, you're straight away plunged into a very mathematical world, and there is no way around it. You get, you get the same thing with, with uh, general relativity, and as I'm discovering to my cost, quantum mechanics too. It's inherently mathematical, and there's no such thing as quantum mechanics for dummies or general relativity made simple. It's not simple. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that better? Thank you. Okay. So the thing I'm interested in here is how can R help this, this process, this rather difficult, uh, unpleasant process? So, of course, for me, when I'm dealing with R, my emphasis on R is the open source nature of it. I want to make my work, I want to make whatever I produce, whatever resources I produce, I want to make them available to the public, I want to make it available for everyone on GitHub or whatever. And I want to see if I can leverage the comments which I get back from the community as well. What I've discovered is that there's very little in the way of open source software out there for me to use. So it basically means I've got to write my own software. And what I want to do is if I can use this, if I can use open source software, I can use it in a pedagogical setting and I can use it to actually teach, uh, teach the physics, which I'm trying to teach. As I say, I don't want this to be a physics talk. I'm not really interested in communicating the, the essence of, of physics, uh, but I've got a couple of formulas here. So uh, the basic idea of relativity is that the speed of light is, is a fundamental constant which can't be exceeded. Uh, so what happens if you get two spaceships colliding or moving towards each other at speed V1 and V2? If, I, if both spaceships are going at 90% of the speed of light, your first thought is, oh, hang on a minute, they're, they're closing at 1.8 times the speed of light, which is kind of forbidden by relativity. And when you teach elementary relativity, certainly, certainly at the level uh, uh, the, uh, of mathematical sophistication that I teach it at, uh, you tend to get lots of formulas here, like, such as on the right-hand side, uh, which is showing the closing velocity of two spaceships which are closing at speed V1 and V2. And you can see that the classical formula needs a denominator as well, 1 plus V1, V2, which effectively stops you having a, uh, the two spaceships closing at a speed more than the speed of light. The difficulty of this is conceptual rather than mathematical. Um, the mathematics is relatively straightforward. I could derive that formula quite easily, and it's relatively easy to understand. It's more or less like the tan x plus tan, tan x plus y formula. The difficulty is conceptual. The thing I have with the students is that your understanding of how velocities work in our Newtonian sort of slow uh, terrestrial, um, terrestrial environment is simply incorrect. You cannot possibly make Newtonian mechanics work when speeds are comparable to the speed of light. And that's a conceptual difficulty, which I've got a huge amount of difficulty telling my students. They say, but it can't really be this. The real formula is the left-hand side. Yeah, they really do close at V1 plus V2. And you, Robin, have got this crazy formula here that's just some kind of mathematical nonsense. So I have to make that formula clear to them, and I'm having difficulty doing that. In particular, the difficulty I'm having is, if I move this up, I won't need to, there we go. There we go. In particular, the, for, the difficulty I've got is uh, if I'm dealing with three-dimensional velocities. Um, the formula I gave you previously, this one here, is only true for collinear velocities, so if everything's moving in one dimension. So what happens if you've got three dimensions to deal with? 
Well, it's a much, much harder system entirely. As you can see here, I've got U plus with a sort of cross around it. I think that's a slash big O in LaTeX. And we can see that we've got this formula here, which is much, 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 much more involved than it is in the case of uh, one dimension. So again, you've got the thing, we've got one over U dot V, we've got a, a vector dot product here. But we've got this term in the curly braces, the gamma term there is the Lorentz term, one over root one minus V squared over C squared. And we can see it's a complicated three, is there three terms? Or Yeah, there's three terms in there, which itself includes dot products and, 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 and so forth. It's an absolute dog's breakfast to deal with. You can derive it, but it takes quite a long time. And the problem is that it's not even commutative. U plus V is not equal to V plus U. So that's an absolute contradiction to your uh, notion of how velocities work. Because it, when you're thinking about how velocities work, when you teach it at elementary, in elementary classical mechanics, you've got the parallelogram law. And I'll show you an example of this uh, later, uh, later, later in the talk. Um, these rules aren't even associative. If you've got A plus B plus C, it depends how you bracket it. You've got A plus B plus C, and you've got A plus B plus C. And they are different, and I'll show you that in R in a few minutes. So how can R help us to understand these very complicated, very non-intuitive, very difficult to understand, but important physical phenomena? Because they crop up in all sorts of... Uh, uh, um, physically realistic situations where you've got objects moving on curved paths. And the answer to this question is the gyro group package. And I'm, I've not yet put it on CRAN for one reason or another, but uh, it's on GitHub and I've got, my, uh, I've got a little GitHub repo here. So I'll show you in action right now. And I'll draw your attention to a few features, which I quite like. I can find my R package here. Is that visible to everybody or shall I, is that visible? Yeah? So here we go, I think I've just l launched it, uh, maybe not. Library, gyro group, gyro group, is that right? And I can talk about a three velocity of 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, let's say. So, as three vel, I've got three velocity. And it creates an object called a three velocity, which is a nice system of uh, it, it's a nice vector of velocities. It's a three velocity. It's got an X component, a Y component, and a Z component. And we can start, now that I've got this basic uh, notion of a three velocity, I can start applying the Lorentz, the generalized Lorentz uh, addition formula to it. And I'll show you how that works now. If I say X becomes a, a random three velocity, let's say a 10 of them, I can say, and let's just call that one, Y, I can talk about X plus Y, and we can see that it's vectorized. So it gives us a nice vector of three velocities because the X was just a single three velocity and the Y was 10. But now what I can do, if I can open the, the uh, page up a little bit, if I move it up here, I can say uh, Y plus X. And you say straight away, you can see that it's different. And so the velocity composition law is not commutative. X plus Y is not equal to Y plus X. And so the way I think about it, and I, 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 was, I realized this morning I should have a little picture, is U plus V is a spaceship moving along at speed U, and it throws a little stone out at velocity V. That is a different situation from a spaceship moving at speed V and throwing a little stone out at speed U. They've got, the stone moves in a different, uh, has a different three velocity after those two processes, which is extraordinarily difficult to understand. And the comment I get from students over and over again is, but it really is the same. You've just obscured this similarity with some mathematical trickery. And so my task is to try and convince the students, no, this is a consistent and uh, coherent view of kinematics. The problem is your intuition. And that's a difficult... Oh, sorry. Yes. Now, I can show you something a little bit more bizarre as well. I've got X and Y. I'll also create a Z. becomes as dot th um, random three velocity, just one of them. X plus... Y plus Z gives me that. But if I change the order of bracketing, if I say X plus Y plus Z, we should be able to see here that we've got the same comments and the same components in the same order. All I've done is bracketed, bracketed them differently. So what I'm doing here is looking at associativity. Now, normally, this is where R syntax starts to kick in. Normally, the symbol that's got this cross in the upright position here is normally reserved for commutative and associative operations, and here it isn't. But I can't very well replace it with a, with a cross symbol. It's got to be a plus. 
So I'm kind of breaking the rules of computer algebra here by applying, I'm overloading the plus operator in a way which is not really intended to be used. If I hit return, we can see again that these numbers are different, and not just different, they are incredibly different. They are very, very, very different. It's not just a tiny point. It's not just a 1% or a 4% uh, difference. It's very, very, very different. So the associative law is not only wrong for this system, it's very wrong. I've got a whole bunch of vignettes, which I might show you. Vignette, uh, commutative, uh, associative. Is it going to find that? go. So one of the things I'm struggling with is different ways to present it. And so what we see here is that the, the uh, failure of the parallelogram law, we've got the highlighted parallelogram here showing a velocity plus a black velocity minus minus the blue one. So you should classically you get back to where you started because I've got A plus B minus A minus minus A minus B. So classically you get back to where you started. But as you can see, if you can trace that line up and up and up, we get a discrepancy marked by the blue lines that shows the failure of the commutative law getting more and more serious as you get velocities larger compared to the speed of light. The thing I want to bring to your attention is that the package allows you to do this directly and it's just two or three lines in R. It's, 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 it's put together so that you can access all this nice mechanics from the Lorentz law directly without thinking about it, which I think is the essence of an R package. Uh, I've got uh, another diagram here. And this diagram, which as you can say is its work in progress, is showing the failure of the associative law. Part of the problem I've got with the associative law is that it... I haven't even got a way to express what it means. It's A plus B plus C compared to A plus B plus C. You'll see that I'm struggling to express it in words, what the difference is. And I don't have a physical experiment, like a spaceship with a stone, to... Uh, have I run out of time? A spaceship launching a shuttle, yes, but it's spaceship launching a shuttle which launches a star compared to the spaceship launching a shuttle which launches... Yeah. It's a difficult thing to understand. So... My, my, my beef with this is that I've put a huge amount of work into this and I've downscaled it. It's very difficult to get this kind of work published in a peer review setting. The, uh, um, the mathematicians say there's no new maths in it. The computer people say there's too much maths in it. And it's kind of falling between lots of stools of public, publication um, venues, which I'm finding very frustrating. Um, I've got one more thing I want to show you because I'm aware I'm running out of time. I've got the Schwarzschild, very difficult to spell the word Schwarzschild, it's very easy to put a, a T in there by mistake. Schwarzschild was a, 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 a mathematician who was working in uh, the early 20th century who came out with one of the very, very earliest non-trivial solutions to the Einstein field equations. I'm very interested in general relativity, and again, the difficulty is parallel to the difficulty I have with special relativity. Specifically, it's a violation of your common sense. Space isn't really curved. Come on, what's going on? The mathematics is very, very difficult. The visualization is hard of it as well. And when I was putting my course together, I taught it for the first time earlier this year, I wanted nice diagrams, nice space-time diagrams of the cool things that happen in general relativity. And the two that I fixed on were gravitational waves and black holes. And my problem was I couldn't find open source software that illustrated these very sexy, very interesting, very hot topic. I'm sure most of you will know that gravitational waves were detected for the first time a few months ago. How can R help with this? How can, how can this thinking help R and how can R help this thinking? Well, I'll show you. GW, bonk. And here we see a nice picture of an animation of a gravitational wave passing in a transverse direction. And we can see how it's, uh, how it's moving. I've got lots and lots of arguments which I could uh, add to this program, but this is basically a gravitational wave passing through the plane of the projector. Each point is at rest. Doesn't look like it, does it? But each point is at rest. The space between them is stretching and compressing. And this shows what a gravitational wave would actually look like if one was passing by. I can control the parameters and change the phasing if you wish. This isn't why I developed the package. This was an afterthought. I'll show you why I developed the package now. What I wanted... 
See, it's so easy to do, put that T in there, and it shouldn't be there. Schwarzschild. Here we go. I can't see it, my eyesight isn't good enough, and I haven't got my glasses. Oh, it's uh, S machine. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> it doesn't appear particularly correctly here because it's all set up to produce a PDF. What we see here is a space time diagram. The vertical axis is time. Uh, I don't think the, yeah, the axis has just about appeared on the left hand side. And what we see on the, on the horizontal axis is a Schwarzschild radius, um, which is distance from the center of the black hole. Now, there's lots of interesting physics which I can talk about here. We've got ingoing light waves, which I've drawn in red, which go uh, from right to left. We've got outgoing light, which, goes, uh, which is blue, which is drawn the other way. And we've got a whole bunch of interesting physical phenomena which I can discuss. Uh, I can show you the event horizon, which is this beautiful fuchsia color here. And inside the horizon, time goes backwards, and the whole thing is terrible, and you can't get out. And the event horizon is a, a very non-intuitive place indeed. You can also see what happens to ingoing and outgoing light at the singularity at this point here, where ingoing and outgoing light, certainly in these coordinates, is parallel, which is a non-obvious a non uh, physical uh, phenomenon. The reason I'm talking about this at an R conference is not that I want to tell you about general relativity. I want to tell you, I could not find open source, high quality uh, PDF diagrams showing the Schwarzschild metric, so I had to do it myself. And again, as you can see on the lower side there, or it's very small writing, I've got a GitHub repository called the Schwarzschild package that plots this diagram using documented source code which tells you what the physics is. So I'm linking the physics and the programming and the R community spirit together here. This is just the most, uh, this is the first one, but I've got different parameterizations. There's Lemaitre parameterization, there's a Guilliard one, and there's five or six other views of a black hole, which I don't have time to show right now. But here is my contribution to the physics community from the R community, or vice, or vice versa, depending on how you view it. Thank you for your attention. That's a, question, that's a question to be discussed over a beer. <laughs> but I would be very happy to talk about it with you. Uh, that's Schwarzschild time. So that's time as measured, by, as, as measured by an observer far from the black hole. This is one of the difficulties we've got with the diagram, that the vertical axis doesn't have a clear meaning. It means time. But of course, space and time are interrelated and they're completely shot to buggery by the black hole. So your question is a good one. But the, the diagram being mathematically precise allows me to address that in the context I want to talk about it. No, I can't. E each one I've got, and I've got about 12 or 13 similar diagrams, is specific and ad hoc to that specific picture. So I don't use any of the generalized theory. It would be lovely to do that, but I'm not clever enough, and I don't think it sits nicely with the spirit of R. It, it's a so, yes, I would like to do it, but I, I